so we had digital cameras and uh, we were trying to get photographs printed of Madeline from the holiday, uh, yes. both to give to the police. But secondly, a very good friend of ours, uh, who we spoke to in the early hours of the morning of the 4th of May, uh, took it upon himself to issue photographs of Madeline to all the major media outlets in the UK. Within a very short space of time, the British press and perhaps the international press had descended on Prada de Luth, is that correct? It is. And you had to make a decision as to whether to interact with them and if so on what basis. Yeah. And what decision did you you make and why? Well, the first thing to say, it was incredibly daunting. Uh, we had been away all day. It was all so apparent to us, uh, whilst we were in the police station in Portimao and the Algarve, that there was already uh, fairly extensive coverage, uh, particularly on Sky News, which was running in the police station, somewhat bizarrely. And um, when we were driving back towards the apartment, it was in the evening, and we could literally see tens, if not hundreds, of journalists outside the apartment and uh, satellite vans, etc., a large number of cameras. And there were two things going through my head, is what they're going to be saying, uh, and we've seen, I think, over many years, uh, privacy being invaded and what stories could be published. But ultimately, um, possibly because we've seen the same thing being done in the UK, I thought it was an opportunity to issue an appeal. I was given no guidance one way or another whether to do that. I knew there could be a, a very heavy downside to interacting, but I made the decision at the time, I, with information I had, that it would probably be in the best interest of the search for our daughter and decided to interact. Yes. You say in your statement, paragraph 15, that in the initial stages, your engagement with the press worked well. Are you able to amplify that just a little bit for us, please? I think for those people who can remember, it was a very unusual scenario, and we got a distinct impression that there was a genuine want to help uh, attitude from the journalists there, and I think also many of the executives who perhaps saw what had happened to us and uh, there was a huge amount of empathy. So I really did feel early on there was a desire to help. Yes. As you explain, the position changed, mm -hmm. but the, the segue perhaps into that change is uh, some evidence you give in relation to the Portuguese criminal system. Now, mm -hmm. each culture, each nation has a slightly different criminal system, and, and, and obviously there can be no criticism ab about that. But what you say in Portugal is that there is no permitted interaction between the law enforcement ag agencies and the press. Is, is that correct? That's correct. Mm. And... Um, do you have a view as to the possible drawbacks of that without necessarily being critical? But I think it's I mean, pretty th obvious it gives rise to the possibility of leaks, doesn't it? Sure. I think uh, the system is open to abuse, is the first thing. Uh, clearly, there was a ferocious appetite, and perhaps in the United Kingdom, where the SIO uh, and the press office for the constabulary leading the investigation would have had a very clear agenda on how to work with the media, uh, what information could be disclosed, what might be helpful, and steering uh, journalists away from certain areas. Obviously, there was none of that happening. And... Um, there was tremendous pressure on the Portuguese authorities to interact with the media. And some of you may remember the very first time that happened, the spokesperson gave a short statement that didn't really say anything, was asked a number of questions and followed every single one of them with, I can't give you any details because of judicial secrecy. Yes. So there was a huge appetite and uh, we quickly realised uh, that there was a tremendous amount of speculation um, in the coverage, both in the newspapers and also you had 24-hour uh, news channels there constantly. And uh, we found that to be unhelpful. In terms of the conduit type of information, is, is this correct? That whatever the strict legal position in Portugal, information was being leaked by the Portuguese police to the Portuguese press. That's stage one. 
then having been leaked to the Portuguese press, the British press then picked up on that self-same information at stage two. Is well, that an accurate I, I cannot tell you for certain that it was the Portuguese police who were leaking information, but for anyone who followed the headlines in July, August and September 2007, I think it would be a perfectly reasonable assumption to make that elements of the inquiry were speaking to the Portuguese police. I do not know if they were speaking, sorry, uh, Portuguese press. I do not know whether they were speaking directly to the British media, but what we clearly saw were snippets of information which, the, as far as I was concerned, the British media could not tell whether it was true or not, which was then reported, often exaggerated and blown up into many tens, in fact hundreds of front page headlines. So the, the British press did not have the means of verifying the information, but your complaint is, is that the information was distorted and magnified. Have I got it right? I think I'm complaining on all of the grounds that okay. they didn't know the source, didn't know whether it was accurate, it was exaggerated and often downright untruthful and often, I believe, on occasion was made up. We're, we're, we're going to cover the detail of that in, in a moment, Dr McCann. Th throughout the summer of 2007, um, the interest of the British press uh, was retained in um, the story, wasn't it? They were constantly there in prior to lose. Right? Yes, it did surprise us. Um, obviously, after the initial period, and I can understand that uh, what we ended up doing by having an international campaign was unprecedented, but we did send a very clear signal uh, as the attention focused more and more on Kate and myself that the focus should be on Madeleine and we fully expected around mid-June for the British media to, to leave. Um, we decided we had to stay in Portugal, to be close to Madeleine, to be close to the investigation and it certainly didn't feel capable of leaving at that point. Uh, so it did surprise us that there was so much ongoing uh, interest when there really wasn't very much happening. In terms of the, the advice you were getting or not getting, again, to put to one side the issue of the PCC into a later sequence of new evidence, which you tell us in your witness statement that um, there, there, were, there were two resources available to you. Paragraph 21, first of all, someone from Bell Pottinger who gave you assistance. You just tell us a little bit about that, please, and the value that person was able to provide to Yeah, so Alex Wilfo, uh, who works for Bell Pottinger, was brought out uh, really to deal with the media crisis management specialist uh, on behalf of Mark Warner. And at that point, um, he was leading the engagement uh, with the media who were present in Pride Deluge, and uh, he was very helpful. He just gave us some simple tips, which we have tried to stick to, and that was, um, if you interact, um, what's your objective? should be your question you ask yourself and how is it going to help and obviously our objective is to find Madeline and that is something that we have tried to apply when we interact with the media today is one of the exceptions where it is not the primary purpose of our engagement. Thank you and you also mentioned someone called Clarence Mitchell who was seconded to the FCO as part of the media yeah. liaison in Praia de Luth and you fairly say that person's help was invaluable. Mm. Uh, is there anything that you would wish to add in relation to the assistance that person gave you? I think, um, I think at times we've been criticised for having somebody to deal with uh, the media, but uh, the volume of requests was incredible, and uh, both nationally and internationally. And it was almost, uh, well, I don't know how Clarence managed it in May and early June 2007, but it was a full-time job just dealing with those requests. And it's been very important. As I said, we have uh, no prior uh, media experience, but in terms of just shielding us from the, the inquiries which were constant. It gave us a little bit of protection, really. Um, and, you know, obviously we were working very hard behind the scenes um, and let us spend some time with our family as well. In paragraph 24 of your statement, Dr McCann, you deal with the argument or the suggestion where well, here you are dealing with the press and then in parenthesis on your own terms, that almost uh, allows the press 
um, open season to deal with you on their terms. Um, maybe I'm slightly over-exaggerating the point, but put in your, in your own words, please, what, what, what is your view about that? That suggests well, it has been argued on uh, many occasions that uh, by engaging, then it was more or less open season, and I think it's crass and insensitive to suggest that by engaging with a view to trying to find your daughter that uh, the press can write whatever they want about you uh, without punishment. Now the next section of your statement deals with accuracy of reporting. And you point out that after a period of time, there was, there was little new news to report. Yeah. It may be at that point that the agenda started to, to morph and paragraph 27 you state clearly it didn't take long before innuendo started to creep in. Um, are, are you able to, to elaborate on that if you, if you were to wish to? Yeah, I mean, I think there were two elements. Uh, the reporting quickly became highly, highly speculative and uh, often stories, um, for example, there must have been McCann fury on the front page of many newspapers over that summer that we quote an unnamed source or friends and unless our phones were hacked, which I don't think they were, then these were made up because they were simply not true. Um, so there was clearly pressure to produce a story. Uh, the reporters who were based in Pride Deluge first thing they did each day was get the Portuguese press, get it translated and uh, decide what they were going to write about. And uh, I don't think any of it was helpful. Well, the, the date you, you give for the, sh the shift of the emphasis of the media reporting is, is about June 2007. Is it, is it then you, you feel the mood may have been moving or turning a bit in the British press? Perhaps a bit later than that. Huh? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think uh, we've realised that if you're in the spotlight uh, for anything, then um, not everything that's going to be written about you is either going to be sympathetic or supportive. So we quickly saw that uh, what uh, we thought maybe a good thing to do would be criticised, whether it be our decision to go to Rome. Um, or not, uh, was criticised in certain quarters, even at the time for us it was very important to us. Um, so there was that element, and then there were more sinister elements which were starting to creep into the reporting. Uh, firstly, the, the first really bad thing was an article that was written in a Portuguese paper which was entitled Pact of Silence and uh, it was starting to refer that there was some sort of sinister agreement between us and our friends to cover up what had happened. And uh, I thought that was rather ludicrous, considering that we were all acting under judicial secrecy and couldn't speak about the details of the event. Uh, but that it was probably towards the end of June 2007 and slowly deteriorated through July uh, culminating in September 2007. Well, the, the real spate of um, offensive and objectionable material, and I can be forgiven for using those epithets, really starts in sep September 2007 and runs on to January 2008, and we'll be looking at those in, at a moment. But in paragraph um, 32, you make the, the general point that um, UK press articles were often based on um, bits and pieces picked up from Portuguese articles and was uh, transmuted from supposition into fact. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the articles that springs to mind actually was a piece in a Portuguese newspaper where somebody uh, talking to the prosecutor and uh, was asking what he thought had happened and uh, there was a quote saying they didn't know whether Madeline was alive or dead and, uh, and I think the falling line was probably dead and that translated into the front page of the Daily Mirror with a photograph of Madeline, Madeline with the headline, She's Dead, which we saw at 11 o'clock at night as we were trying to go to bed and... Obviously, that was one of the most distressing headlines that is presented as if it's factual, and it was just taken from a supposition, I don't know, probability. It was incredible. Yes. 
One, one key event in this narrative is you becoming, if I pronounce it right, Arguido mm -hmm. uh, under Portuguese law, which, which occurred on the 7th of September 2007, and this is paragraph 34 of your witness statement. To be, to be clear about, about it, and you'll correct me if, you're, if I'm wrong, because you know more about this than me, Arguido does not mean suspect, it means person of interest. Is, is that right? That is what we were advised was the closest correlation or translation within uh, UK law at the time. And I think it is probably important to emphasise that as a witness in Portugal at that time, you were not entitled to any legal representation. So if the police wanted to ask any question, which your answer may give incriminating evidence, then they must declare you are Guido, and then you were entitled to have a lawyer there. And in many ways, you could argue that all parents of a missing child, certainly those who would be the last mm. to have seen them, could have to answer questions like that. So the being labelled our Guido was not necessarily such a bad thing. However, I will acknowledge that there were leaks by elements of the investigation team which clearly were trying to portray that there was strong evidence that Madeline was dead and that we were involved. Well, there may be there two points here. The first point is the obvious one that needs to be stated.